welcome back. We've decided to shake things up. Not unlike a homespun vinaigrette. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Dishing on Julia, the official companion podcast of Julia, the Max original series inspired by the life of Julia Child. I'm your host, Carrie Diamond, and I'm the founder of Cherry Bomb Magazine and the Radio Cherry Bomb Podcast, where I report on some of the most interesting women in the world of food, including trailblazers just like Julia. Tonight, ladies and germs, I shall be your hostess. And I want to hear those phones ringing like the bells of Notre Dame. After each episode, I'm dishing with creatives from the show, as well as special guests to give us a little perspective and food for thought. In the first half of the pod, I'm speaking with Julia stars David Hyde Pierce and Fiona Glascott. Then it's the legend himself, Chef Jacques Pepin. Few people knew Julia as well as Jacques. They were friends and colleagues, and Jacques has a lot to share in just a little bit. Before we delve into the details, just a quick heads up. Spoiler alerts are on today's menu. If you haven't caught up on the latest Julia episode, you might want to press pause and go enjoy the show. We'll be here waiting. Everybody else, Oniva. Think of what we might do with real produce and a bit of forethought. Care to cook with me again? Episode 6 kicks off with some CBS executives attempting to woo Julia away from WGBH. She turns, of course, to Paul to help her weigh the offer. But would you really want to live in Los Angeles, Paul? We'd have to go around on roller skates. I'm not half bad on roller skates. Avis continues to avoid Julia's calls, further straining their relationship. At WGBH, the annual telethon is in full swing, and Julia steps up to raise morale and money. I'll tell you what. I will come to your house, cook dinner for you, something scrumptious with lots of butter, if you are the first person to pledge $100 right now. Judith and Paul pair up to discuss the CBS situation and challenge each other to a friendly cooking competition. Elaine's frustration over her relationship with Julia intensifies, while Alice has her sights set on a big prize. Think about it. What is the most important meal in this country? Uh, breakfast. State dinners. Uh. Russ, Julia is going to take WGBH behind the scenes into the White House kitchen. First time anyone's ever filmed there. Now, let's talk with David Hyde Pierce, who plays Paul Child, and Fiona Glascott, who plays editor Judith Jones. What is that? You never seen a Twinkie before? Never. David and Fiona, welcome back to Dishing on Julia. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you, Carrie. It's lovely to see you. Let's talk about your characters. Fiona, we're going to start with you. You play Judith Jones. Tell us who Judith is. Judith Jones was a extremely talented editor. She's probably best known for saving Anne Frank from the reject pile when she worked in France. She translated Sartre and Camus. Once that happened, she went over to New York and she worked for Knopf, where mastering the art of French cooking fell on her lap. And she was a huge fan of France and everything to do with food and French cooking. So this fell in her lap and her dream came true. And she was very instrumental in having this published by Knopf. And from then the TV show happened and the rest is history. How did you originally prepare to play Judith? I read her memoir and I read a lot about her. There's been a lot written about Judith, but the, the biggest help I had was watching her because there's a lot of filmed interviews with her and she received a lot of awards. What you don't get when you read about someone is you don't get their warmth and their wit and their attention to detail. One of the things about her, which I love, on top of her brilliance and her mind, is she loves being around other people. And you can tell that when you watch her, especially in the question and answer sessions. She's really listening. She's really enjoying it. She really wants to know what everyone else thinks, I think, helped me give those layers to her when we started to work on the show. You want to do that justice. So I was really helped in that way. David, you play Paul Child. Tell us about Paul. Paul was a jack of all trades. He was so skilled in so many things. He was a diplomat. He was working in the OSS, the precursor to our Secret Service and the CIA, when he met Julia during World War II. But he was also an amazing craftsman. He worked with his hands. He built beautiful, fine furniture. He was an incredible artist, painter and drawer, and also, like Judith, a wit 
and a very naughty man. And when you get to see, uh, I got into the, the Schlesinger Library to, to go through Paul and Julia's papers and diaries and slightly obscene Valentine cards to each other. It was just wonderful to see, you know, we, we know from the outside these people, but to see behind the scenes that they were people, really wonderful, funny, witty, loving, earthy people. Aside from the research you did, what else did you do to prepare to play Paul? There's a lot written about the two of them, so I was able to go into that looking at a lot of pictures. As a little boy, I used to draw a lot, and I hadn't done it since, but Paul was such a visual artist, and I thought, oh, I'll probably be called upon to at least look like I'm painting something or drawing something. So I went back to the drawing board, literally, which was so much fun. I worked on the dialect, because he also has a dialect. They're sort of from the Boston area, and there's a kind of Boston mainline way of speaking that he and his family had. So things like that. Fiona, tell us what's different about playing a character based on an actual person versus someone purely fictional. How do you approach that? For me, the most important thing with that is I feel a responsibility to do them justice. You always want to do your characters justice, but when you're dealing with a real person, you really want to make sure you're doing a good job. And a good job is not just making sure that they're wonderful or they're perfect. A good job is being honest. I suppose in a, in a way, I feel a little bit like a guard dog when it comes to Judith and when people talk about her. We are so blessed and lucky to have some of the best writers in the world. So that actually is not ever an issue in this show. Everybody, Chris and Daniel and Emily and Kate and everybody does such an incredible job and has such respect for the people they're dealing with and the subject matter and are so talented themselves. But just the way I approach Judith, she's a real person. I never forget that. And I always go back to watching those videos that I talked about earlier and reading the things she says. And I have a notebook with her quotes. It's always present in my mind. And I play her voice before every scene going right again. I've recorded all, a little so I can just hear her little intonations and her little laugh. And it's, it's I don't exactly laugh like her, but it's just she's there. And I have such respect for her and what she's done for the world of literature that that it's just a bit of a bigger responsibility. That's how I feel. David, in all the conversations I've had with the creators, Chris and Daniel, they're very adamant that it's not a documentary. So tell me how you approach Paul in that respect. It's a really good question because I'm with Fiona on this, that feeling a responsibility to the real person, to their family and everything. And it's interesting because if you ask different members of the cast, they have different approaches to this. Some people feel, I need to just be free to play this. I don't want to be hemmed in or be worrying about what they would have done. And in my case, I think we have to strike a balance. Sometimes there are things that, that I realize now that we've been doing this, this series for a while, there are things that are not literally what happened, but they are always in the service of telling a larger story about what actually was true. But I do remember one specific thing, which was there was a, an episode where Paul was working on the kitchen cabinets or something, and he had a toolbox. Whoever the director was had picked this extremely small, red, effete toolbox. No reason, but they hadn't talked to me about it. I took one look at it, and I said, get that thing out of here, because I knew this was a man who built the cabinets in the kitchen, and he built in this beautiful Spanish-style, whatever, covered in the living room. And I said, he's not walking around with a second-grader's toolbox, so they got me a man's toolbox. So <laughs> I get uppity about those things. Oh, that's such an interesting detail. Yeah, Paul was the one who gave us the pegboard, for that's which right. every home chef is forever grateful. Mm -hmm. All right, David, we have to talk about your twin episode. Mm -hmm. I know we're not here for that episode today specifically, mm -hmm. In real life, as on the show, Paul has an identical twin brother, Charlie Child. Charlie shows up in the season at a stressful time for the child. How do you as an actor approach a twin scene? First, I say thank you, because it's such a great opportunity and challenge. Of course, I had done a lot of research. Charlie wrote a book called Roots in the Rock, which was about his family building a house in Maine, in, in the wilds of Maine, and occasionally Julia and Paul visited to help out. And so there was a lot of information in there, and you could tell the way Charlie wrote about Julia and Paul, a little bit of what their relationship was as older brother and younger brother, and even though they were twins. The other thing that I did, though, was I watched a lot of actors playing twins 
to see what people did. And there were some performances that it was clearly all about making the characters as different as possible. That was sort of the acrobatic act of it. And then there were others that were, you kind of forgot the actor was doing that. Part of it was figuring out, all right, where do I want to fall on this? That was the main thing I decided. I don't want this to be about, oh, look how great, look, he has a whole different voice and he has this. I just, I wanted it to be sort of internally different. And then the other most important thing is that most of the work in playing the twins was done by everybody else because I had my double who had to always change wigs and be me and we had to do each scene twice. The camera crew, the tech of an editing of actually making it look real, the rest of the cast who had to go through every scene twice as many times because we were changing roles and makeup and hair and wardrobe, everyone working to figure out how do we subtly make these two guys different, all of that. And then, of course, it was so well written that then it was fun to be able to play kind of the opposite of Paul, especially in relationship to Julia, which was, I think, disconcerting, but also fun for both Sarah and me. You also had to play piano as a twin. Oh, that's the other thing I did. I spent many months learning to play the violin because in real life, Paul played the violin, Charlie played the cello. And when they were boys, their dad passed away very early and their mom was a singer and they would go to fancy people's houses and play to make money until the boys got in a fight with some bullies and used their instruments to beat the bullies away and destroyed the violins and the cellos and never played again. But originally we were going to have the twins do that, and then at a certain point the writers came up with a song, this great song, Life is Just a Bowl of Cherries, that they wanted us to sing. And I realized no one sings while they play the violin. You just don't do that. Since I do play the piano, we decided to make it a piano duet, and I actually got to go into a recording studio We had a wonderful arranger who arranged the piece for four hands, and I did each part. I had to record the lower part for Paul, then record the upper part for Charlie, and then record both voices singing in harmony. And then we filmed it, and it was complicated filming, but it was fun. Fiona, how was that all for you? You were not playing a twin, but you were there. Oh, my God. I was just like, don't speak until he's finished speaking, because it was such an amazing experience. Watching David and Ian, his double do this all day. It was really a privilege to be able to sit there, particularly to be there, but particularly at this dinner scene where they had to know every single line and David seamlessly swapped between both. And it was so beautifully done. And your characterization was fabulous and subtle and spot on and so different. And David, you were just as as always a joy, but it seemed like you were having even more fun with double the work. It was just wonderful to be part of, actually. And can I add, thank you for mentioning Ian's name, because also they got someone who was physically close enough to me, but also they got someone who was an incredible Mm -hmm. actor. They knew that was a priority. That was a priority for them. He not only learned both roles, as I did, but also he was wonderful to play with. So I could really act with him and get stuff back. So that was a huge gift. Fiona, what has been a scene of note for you so far? I was going to actually say that scene around the dinner table, David, because it was such an an incredible experience just to be there. For me, as Judith, I loved that we got to see a little bit of who she is at home and experience the stresses of what it is to be a working woman and all the stress that she's under, that she's carrying around. And I love that we got to just see that the writers brilliantly wrote. We all just want to collapse into our wardrobes at times and and burst into tears. And actually, tears are a wonderful way to release tension. And I'm really, I was just really happy for Judith, because I think she needed a holiday, for it to go off and let her hair down. And it was a really lovely exploration of what Judith Jones might do when she needs to let her hair down. Because as as David says, this is not exactly what happened to these people, but in this world and who that what we know about them and with all the great writing and the wonderful directing, let's let's see what we can do. So I really, I really enjoyed exploring that side of of Judith. Fiona, you and Judith have so many intense scenes in this season. How do you prepare for scenes like those that are just so emotionally intense? I mean, I've got to say, from my side, and I think from Judith's side, we run towards those scenes because we get on so well. 
Judith Light has actually become a bit of a mentor for me in my own life, to be honest. She is unbelievably warm and fun. And I know, David, you know her well, because what we're talking about is so painful and the scenes are so painful. She's so easy to work with because she's so brilliant. I think we work very similarly. We're very big on preparing. We're very big on getting together and having this experience in the moment on the set. And, you know, it's a creative space and we're hugely supportive of each other. And, and I get to sit down and, you know, you basically have this heartbreaking, stunning performance and it doesn't feel like you're in a performance. It just feels like it's happening. Even though they're very painful, I, I look forward to them so much. We it's a turn around and we go and link arms and we go and we sit down and we tell jokes to each other and we chat about our pets and we get back to it again. It's it's joyful. It's joyful. Blanche is one of those characters who we've forgotten a little bit about in history. Blanche is an extraordinary woman. During the Second World War, she I read her book, The Borzoi, I think it's called, and she was like bribing soldiers with rations so that they, you know, help her fly into England and, and bring a writer some stockings and some chocolate or something just to keep their spirits up and keep them writing. Her talent and her determination and her really clear knowledge and understanding of what great writing was, no matter what the subject was and who that person was, and also how to help that writer, how to massage that. What they needed is something that she gave to Judith Jones, which was Judith used to take people on holiday with her, them and their mothers, you know, their pets, whatever it took to give them enough support and relaxation. And Blanche's character had all of that in spades, but then also was completely, was treated terribly by her husband, was not acknowledged in her work. But how far she got at that stage as a woman in that industry is phenomenal and yet was still fighting as we still are in so many ways. But what she did is she reached down that ladder and she pulled someone up after her and she got Judith and she was like, you, you, you're my girl. And then she and then that's one of the reasons why I think that she's so hard on her, but why they have such deep love and respect for each other. It's such an honor to be able to jump into those scenes, especially with Judith Light. Yeah, it's just fabulous. Fiona mentioned that Judith has become a mentor to her. This episode deals a lot with careers and career choices. David, who's been a mentor to you oh, gosh. over your incredible career? I've had probably too many to count. I'll mention just one person because she just passed away, Frances Sternhagen, an incredible uh, New York mainly actress who I worked with when I was very young, when I was first starting out. It wasn't that she told me things. It was just I learned so much by her example. And one of the things I only realized in retrospect was I would watch her and I would think she would try all these different things in rehearsal, but everything she tried was great. And I thought, boy, how do you do that? And I realized you do that by devoting yourself to this craft year after year after year after year until you kind of only have great choices to make because you've, you've made all the crappy choices somewhere along the way. And that's what I was specializing in at the time was crappy choices. So her model, her modeling of what it was to be a dedicated, wonderful actor is something that just lives with me now. And so I don't want to, you know, exclude any of the other many people. But since Franny just passed, I just wanted to mention her. And I would also say, just to add on in terms of support, the guy I married, who I've been with for 40 years, he and I are both in the same business. Brian was a, an actor when we first met. He's a writer now. But there is no one who knows me better. We are uh, each other's best critics and judges and advice for careers or advice about a role or how to do things. So much like Paul and Julia in that way, that kind of mutual support. Those are the two that I will pluck out, Franny and Brian. Well, it's so funny that you mentioned Brian because you teed up my next question nicely. We're sitting next to each other and I couldn't help but notice your wedding ring and was reminded when we had a, a lovely dinner last year with folks from the cast who were able to join us in New York City and I got to spend time with your husband, mm -hmm. who was really delightful. <laughs> yes, he And is. it crossed my mind. Julia, on some levels, is a show about marriage and is so respectful of marriage there's Judith's relationship with her husband, which we got a little glimpse of this season. There's maybe the most complicated 
Miss Simcoe's marriage. Mm-hmm. Avis constantly refers to her beautiful relationship with her husband who's mm-hmm. passed, and then, of course, Paul and Julia. And it doesn't surprise me that you're able to play that so beautifully knowing what your real-life husband is like. You're absolutely right. It is without making conscious choices. I just bring that in because it's it's the best. And it really does apply to the situation because there are people who are enough in the same world of food and publicity and everything else that they can successfully advise and trust each other. And also they just love each other. This is something that gets actually said in one of the episodes that they were friends before they fell in love. And that is also true in my life. I've got a pretty fantastic marriage too myself. So... <laughs> I've got a lovely husband. So it's a really lovely thing to, I, I like what you said, David, that it's just, you know, you, you you sort of have that support and love and understanding that you can just, you know, you really think about it. You just end up bringing it into the scene. And, and it's interesting, the scenes with John Ellison Connolly, who's fantastic, who plays my husband, Evan, it's one of the easiest things in the world. And also because he's a great actor you know so it makes life easy but you're thrown in and you're supposed to show that you've had a marriage for the last whatever number of years and it was the easiest thing in the world with him he's such a such a lovely man david would love to know a favorite scene of yours from one of the recent episodes honestly my favorite scene was when alice did her show seeing her introduce the show seeing what we got to see of that show and how powerful and strong and wonderful it was as surprising and important now, given all that's going on in the world and in the country, as it would have been then. And to see, it's just, I love in every aspect of that, in the performance of it, the writing of it, that it was so good. And you thought, oh, this is wonderful. And then to see it taken away is is really tough. Fiona, how about you? I mean, I agree that those scenes were incredible, really incredible. But I have two other ones. One is when Robert Joy's face, when Sarah does, she's so fantastic, does this incredible speech. And you just see his face realizing that he's not going to get fired. And I remember on the day, standing beside you, David, I remember being really emotional because it was so moving. He's so moving. And Sarah's so brilliant. Obviously, she's incredible, but it's done lightly, you know, when it needs to be. And it makes it more moving and his face was beautiful that and also David the scene where you and I give each other our surprise ingredient because I really enjoyed that we were I was really angry with you and I also it was my first time throwing a Twinkie and let me tell you it's not as easy as it looks uh, there was lots of fear for the camera and there was people practicing and I was all, I've managed to get away with it just, but I really enjoyed that because I, we had so much fun doing all that cooking stuff together. It was, it was such a giggle. Absolutely. It, it was so great that they gave us, because we had done the baking bread episode in season one. And I think the writers responded to that. It was fun to see us team together, but then they had the brilliance of having us team together, but in competition, which is always so fun to play. And I totally agree with you that Twinkie throwing is never taught in acting schools and it should be. It's never taught, but it is now on my CV. No. So. All right. Last question for you two. Julia is coming over for dinner. What do you serve? David will go with you first. Cocktails. All right, I forgot. You don't cook, right? No, I don't cook. You're right. I would have Brian cook. But also, as it happens, Paul, that was his thing. He made up the most outrageous, strange, and to me, undrinkable cocktails. But that was a big thing at the time. And my mom always said the secret to a great dinner was a long cocktail hour. Okay. No snacks during the cocktail hour? No, because then people won't know what they're eating. It'll be fine. Okay, Fiona, how about you? I think I do what we do at home anyway, which is my husband, Tom, cooks the day before. Because I just find on the day, I think it just might be a bit stressful. I want to enjoy Julia Child coming over. And the stress, we can take a whole day cooking the day before. So something like Bouffe Bourguignon or so Coco Riesling or Coco Van that's going to get better overnight. So at least if you've made a terrible mistake, everything works together overnight and it will certainly taste of something. That's what I would do. And then we can enjoy the time and also have some great cocktails. That sounds like a great idea. Thank you both so much. It's it's really wonderful seeing you too. And you just bring so much joy to us every Thursday. So thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. Now let's check in with Chef Jacques Pepin, culinary icon and a great friend of Julia's. Oh, come on, the old team. If you don't help me here, people will starve or worse, eat. 
Jacques Pepin, welcome to Dishing on Julia. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'd love to know if you could share a little bit about your journey and how you became a chef. Oh, boy. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was born in a family of, or, you know, my mother was a, a, a cook. She had a little restaurant. My father was a cabinet maker. So, you know, I'm turning 88. So 80 years ago, uh, we didn't have the telephone. We didn't have the television, of course. We didn't have a, a radio even. Life was very easy. I was going to be a cabinet maker or a cook, one or the other. Probably since I was six, seven, I was already in the kitchen, you know, helping with my brother and peeling potato or doing what. When I finished primary school in France, that you had to go until the, like 14. And then I was 13 when I took all of the exam, left and decided, okay, I'm going into apprenticeship. I left home to go into a formal three year apprenticeship. So that was, that was the way it was done at the time. Nothing special about it. And what was it that made you stick with it? No, I loved it. I mean, you know, uh, getting into the kitchen and the excitement and uh, working and moving from one place to the other. And then I ended up in Paris, Rock Mill more, most of the 50s. So it was exciting. That's what I decided. I said, I'm going to go to America. Most people come to America for economic reason to get a better job or political reason, a racial reason, or whatever those things. I didn't have any of that. I had a good job in France. I brought on the restaurant, but I wanted to go to America to have like the, the golden fleece, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so I came here for a year and that was close to 60 years because. Is it true you were the personal chef of French President Charles de Gaulle in the 50s? Yes, well, from 56 to 58, I was chef to, to under the Fourth Republic in France. The government was changing at a rapid pace. So I had them things. With me, a chef of the head of state for three years, for three of them. The goal was uh, the one that I stayed the longest with, the last one, yes, in 1958. Jacques, what was that experience like? Well, you know, at the time, the food, the, the chefs was back in the kitchen in a hall, and you had to conform. I mean, I served people like uh, Ivan Aware, Nero, Tito, Macmillan, those were the head of state at the time. Never once would they ever call you to get kudo in the dining room. <laughs> that did not exist. The cook within the kitchen was very low on the social scale. I dealt with man the role every Monday. I did the menu for the week. We talked and all that, but basically, you know, the, the chef position in life was quite different than it is now. Is it true you turned down the same role with President John F. Kennedy? Yeah, the, exactly for the same reason. I really did not. Did they realize the, the, the potential or whatever? And I said, I'd never been on radio, television, or anything like this. I was in New York. I wasn't uh, too long. I was going to Columbia University at the time. I started doing a new life. I didn't want to challenge again. But to be truthful, yes. Any good mother at that time would have wanted their child to marry a lawyer or a doctor, or not a cook. <laughs> so now we are genius. I don't know what happened, but in any case, I went to work for Howard Johnson and I was there from 1960 to 1970. So in 1970, I opened a restaurant in New York called La Potagerie on Fifth Avenue. Then I was a consultant for the Russian Bureau. Then I opened the World Trade Center with Joe Baum. I'm saying all of that to say I would never have been able to do that on a French chef. So I was very 10 months good. Jacques, you were also very early to food television. Can you tell us about that? Well, yes. I mean, actually, when I opened the potage in 1970, I went to do a What's My Line to Tell the Truth or the Truth Show. I was invited to do, so I, I did that. But the first series that I did on PBS was 1982 with Jacksonville, Florida. I did a series called Everyday Cooking with Jack Pepper. Eventually, I went to KQED, the PBS station in San Francisco, and there I did 12 series of 26 shows in in that 30 year period. So that was a while ago. <laughs> a lot of us didn't know the real Julia. Can you tell us about the Julia you knew? Yes. I mean, she, <laughs> she was, you know, people look at her on television. We had a great time. We cooked together. I mean, I met her in 1960. So I knew her for half a century, basically. And she was exactly the same on television or off television. I don't think there was any, any differences. What people often don't realize is that when we did a show, I mean, we did many shows together at BU and so forth, but when we did series together, we didn't have any recipe. She decided, okay, let's not do recipe. We just cook 
you know, see what's, what's going on, let's do stew or let's do whatever we decide the day before. Of course, it was difficult for the cameraman and all of that. They had no idea we were going to go left, right, and so forth. But it was uh, certainly fun for us. I mean, at the beginning of the show, Juliette told me, why don't you write a hundred things you would like to do and I'll do the same. And I think three of mine made it, uh, if I recall this. And another thing that on television, as you do, you know, when we do a show of 30 minutes on PBS, I did several series, but we do it to do it on time. Or then the guy going back, assigned 10 minutes, five, three minutes, two minutes, the wrap up and so forth. When we did it with Julia, she said, we're going to cook. When it's over, we'll tell you. Some show were 80 minutes, 70 minutes, 80 minutes. I would, I, I wish we could find the B-roll, but they have disappeared. So there was no, no recipe so we could do whatever we wanted. There was no time constraint and we had a lot of wine to drink. So it was a, it was a fun show to do. She loves to work for PBS and I do too. Who paired you and Julia? Who thought it would be a good idea to put you two on TV together? I don't think there is anyone who paired us because I knew him. I knew her since 1960, as I said. And then when I started teaching at BU in the mid 80s, you know, I would call her when I saw her in New York to so I, I go to Boston. So I have breakfast with her. We had lunch, we had dinner, we talked. And she ended up saying, okay, let's come and teach together at BU. So we started. And at some point in the mid 80s, she said, you know, we have to do something in gastronomy and cooking at the, at the university level. There is nothing. So we wrote to John Silbert, who was the president of BU at the time, to do a program. And he didn't want to do it undergraduate. So we ended up doing a master of liberal arts with a concentration in gastronomy. And that program, which is still going on now, I was teaching there last week, actually. It's still going on now. And in my knowledge, at least, it's one of the only places in the country. And uh, Julia was very influential in this. Did you ever think you would have a TV show that ran for as long as it did? Oh, no, never. <laughs> never really realize that, you know, you, you do this and you expect it to be one or twice and uh, kind of amazing, yes, right. Why did you two have such good chemistry? I think she was very natural and, and me too. I mean, we had good chemistry, but we argue a lot. We fight all the time. <laughs> so, she always said that we started cooking together. Well, I started in 1949, but she started in 1949 in Paris too. She came during that time. She was 23 years older than me, but basically the style of the time, the style of cooking. Oh, yes, it was the same. In fact, the first time that I met her, we spoke French. She spoke French, but better than the English at the time. We did. It was at my friend Helen McCullough in New York. And then after we, we remained friends uh, forever. And in a sense, I remember when we did those show together, we got many letters where people say she was so much more French than I was <laughs> because... She was still cooking often in the old style we did in France at that time. And Anna was changing already more and uh, she was arguing with me. And uh, yeah, we, we argue on, on stage quite a lot. I mean, cooking, but we had no recipe. So why did I put uh, a scallion in that dish? Because they happened to be on the table. So I throw them in. You know, we didn't have to follow uh, any recipe or anything. It was fun. So when you say you two fought all the time, you mean good-naturedly about things like ingredients? Oh, sure. Like, you know, she, I, I use black pepper and she and only use white pepper, you know, so I, I use kosher salt and she use regular salt. I said, don't you? That works. And certainly with Julia, it was also a bit of a game, you know, because when we cook, we taste, we cook, you add this, you taste. So she said, taste, I would taste, what do you think? I said, I think it needs salt. She tasted it, I know it's fine. And next time I said, she said, taste, I would taste. And I said, I think it's fine. She said, needs salt. And she would, you know. Yeah, we already had that kind of game playing right? together, but we had a good time. Jacques, what's been a favorite moment of yours from Julia? Well, it's showing, showing all of those people, certainly like Judy Joan. I mean, I was friends with Judy Joan too. I mean, I did several books with her. Not only the book I did with Julia, but I did The Art of Cooking in the Middle 80, which may be the best book that I have done, you know. So uh, a double volume book with 4,000 pictures. And then I did another book, Jacques Pepper Celebrate, at the end of the 90s or whatever with her. It was great to see her, to see her not only as Judy Joan, but even with, with, her, with her private life and all that, or Russ Morash or 
having the veto. I mean, I knew I had met all, all of those people, so I didn't know them this way. And I said, the show itself is much more encompassing than a regular television show. It goes toward the social situation at the time, political situation, and all kind of other thing, which, uh, which makes it interesting. Jacques, I want to talk about your foundation. Back in 2016, you started the Jacques Pepin Foundation with a mission to support individuals and organizations in achieving success through culinary skills. I'm curious what inspired you to choose that particular mission. Well, it was actually my son-in-law, Rolly, who teaches at Johnson and Well, in a chef too, but he's a, a full professional there. And I, I've been teaching all my life at the French Culinary Institute in New York, at BU and, and so forth. So he told me at that point, what do you think you would like to teach? And we talked about it and I said, you know, people who have been a bit disenfranchised by life, but in six, eight weeks, I can teach someone, you know, with the video and all of that, that we have how to peel a potato the right way, how to poach an egg, how to whatever, very simple stuff, in the kitchen. And that person in the kitchen, if she or he likes it, then can stay there and maybe five years later, you're the chef, you're in charge and you kind of redo your life, you know, as proud of yourself and so forth. So it's a good thing to, to do. And we need, certainly we need people like that in the kitchen. And you're doing some interesting things to support the foundation. You've been doing all the videos, the video cookbooks. How did those oh, come yeah. about? Yeah, well, we, we also, I have to say, in the beginning of the pandemic, Claudine, Claudine is my daughter, she's the president of them. So she said, why don't you do things of like three, four, five minutes, what you have in your refrigerator during the pandemic on Facebook. She does Facebook, you know, I don't, but so I did, I think we're, we're doing 320 of those already. And usually we do 10 a day when we do, they are about four minutes, five minutes, simple recipes. So Claudine has been, uh, my daughter, she put them on every day. And of course, Tina Salter is the editor that I used to have at KQED, the PBS station. So she's the one editing those little uh, show. So we use them on, I don't know, on Instagram or whatever it is. Well, you certainly seem like you're having fun on social media. I can say that much. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, I am a cook, so ultimately that's what I do. And uh, if you do what you love to do, uh, you never have to go to work, right? What do you think Julia would think about the food world today? She was always very very optimistic about the food world. I mean, you know, I remember her also in the 70s, 80s, going to restaurants together with the, as I said, the IWF and all of those organizations. The first thing she would say, let's go to the kitchen. She said, is there any woman chef here? <laughs> she would always ask for the woman chef, but she would always also go and shake the hand of the dishwasher and the chef. So she was very comfortable this way. Jacques. Our last question is always, Julie is coming over for dinner. What would you uh -huh. make? Did you two have dinner together a lot? Oh, many times. Probably more at her house than at mine. But very often, usually when I get to her house, uh, she would say, okay, what do you want to cook? So I said, I don't know, what do you have? So she said, well, I brought some lamb chop today or whatever it was. So and we start cooking. And to a certain extent, the same way at my house, there was not really anything really planned unless we had special dinner like we did at BU, like the last dinner I did in our kitchen with the student, it was to raise money for, I forget for what. So yeah, the menu was planned ahead and we would move from the dining room back to the kitchen, back to the dining room, kitchen and so forth. So cooking together. What would you make for her? What she liked the best in the world, bread and butter. Well, if you have the greatest bread and you have the greatest butter, it's difficult to beat bread and butter. Thank you to David Hyde Pierce, Fiona Glasgow, and Jacques Pepin for joining us on Dishing on Julia, the official companion podcast of Julia, now streaming on Max. Dishing on Julia is produced by the Cherry Bomb Podcast Network. Special thanks to CDM Sound Studios and City Vox Studio. Our executive producers are Catherine Baker and Yasmin Nesbat. Our associate producer is Jenna Sadu, and our editorial assistant is London Crenshaw. I'm your host, Carrie Diamond. We'd love for you to leave a rating and review for Dishing on Julia on your favorite podcast platform, and be sure to subscribe. When you leave your review, pretend you are one of the successful WGBH bidders, and Julia is cooking for you. What would you like her to make? Boeuf bourguignon, cassoulet, salade nichoise? Let me know. In the meantime, leaving you with a bit of wisdom from Julia. You know, this place is one of a kind. It brought me to the party, and now it's my one and only, my 
home. And maybe there are grander homes out there, but home is home. And there's nowhere else I would rather be.